Hi everyone, my name is Faustine Ramirez and I'm a master tutor with Med School Coach for Step 1 and Step 2. Today we'll be reviewing a Step 2 CK question in hematology and immunology. So let's get started and read the stem first. A 22-year-old man with beta thalassemia presents to the emergency department with fatigue and dyspnea. Physical examination reveals pallor, but no jaundice or scleral icterus a normal cardiopulmonary and abdominal examination. His extremities are warm and well perfused. Laboratory results reveal a hemoglobin of 6.2, MCV of 68, platelets 190,000, and leukocytes 7,500. One unit of packed red blood cells is transfused. 20 minutes into the transfusion, the patient starts complaining of severe flank pain and chills. Temperature is 38.8, Heart rate is 115, blood pressure is 105 over 70, and respiratory rate is 18. His urine is dark brown. Which of the following is the most likely mechanism for these findings? So I'd like you to pause the video and try to work through this question on your own first. All right, welcome back. So let's work through this question together now. So the first step when we approach a question is always to read the last sentence. So to read the question itself, which of the following is the most likely mechanism for these findings? So this is going to be a question about an underlying pathophysiology mechanism. So then we very briefly glance at the answer choices in about five seconds, and we don't have to read every single one in detail, but we just look and we see that these are related to different pathophysiologic mechanisms, and they involve immunoglobulins and T lymphocytes and cytokines. And so they're all related to some immune mediated mechanism. And then we start from the top and we read the stem together. So let's highlight the key elements from the stem. So this is a 22 year old man with beta thalassemia presenting to the emergency department with fatigue and dyspnea. Physical examination reveals pallor, but no jaundice or scleral ectoris, and normal cardiopulmonary and abdominal examination. His extremities are warm and well perfused. So on exam, he's pale, but the rest of his exam is within normal limits. Laboratory results reveal hemoglobin of 6.2, so he's profoundly anemic, an MCV of 68, so it's a microcytic anemia, which is consistent with his diagnosis of beta thalassemia, platelets of 190,000, which is normal, and leukocytes of 7,500, which is normal. One unit of packed red blood cells is transfused. So as soon as you read these sent the sentence in any question, you should already be thinking that this may be a question relating to either side effects of the transfusion or a transfusion reaction or that has something to do with the transfusion. Because when they tell you this, it could just be there as an extra piece of information. But a lot of times when they tell you about a certain transfusion or a medication that it's administered or an intervention that's performed, you already be, want to be thinking about are there any complications or side effects relating to the intervention that is being given. So we read on, 20 minutes into the transfusion, the patient starts complaining of severe flank pain and chills. Temperature is 38.8 degrees Celsius, so he has a fever. Heart rate is 115, so he's tachycardic. Blood pressure is 105 over 70, which is still within normal limits, and respiratory rate is 18, also within normal limits. His urine is dark brown. Which of the following is the most likely mechanism for these findings? So before we move on to the answer choices, let's take a moment to synthesize the findings that we highlighted. Remember that board's questions, two-step questions, the first step is to identify what the underlying diagnosis is, and the second step is to answer a specific question about that diagnosis, whether it's about pathophysiology or diagnostics, workup or treatment. So putting these pieces together, we have a 22-year-old with beta thalassemia who's presenting with pretty profound anemia who receives a transfusion and 20 minutes into the transfusion develops a reaction to the transfusion. So when we're thinking about transfusion reactions, the first thing we wanna do 
is to try to identify what are the characteristic features of this reaction? What are the defining features? Because there are multiple different transfusion reactions and they all have fairly different presentations. Um, the two that can present somewhat similarly are the two that can present with a fever. Um, one is an acute febrile hemolytic reaction and the other one is a non-hemolytic reaction. And they can both present with elevated temperatures. So one thing that we should point out first is that this patient does indeed have a fever. So we're already thinking that this is going to be one of the reactions that presents with a fever. And then his other characteristic or defining features are that he has severe flank pain and dark urine. And the time frame is also really important. The time frame of these transfusion reactions can also help you differentiate between the different types of reactions. So we tell or we're told that it's 20 minutes into the transfusion. So that's also important. The tachycardia here is likely in response to the fever. Um, the blood pressure is still normal, so we don't think that this patient is hypovolemic, at least yet, but has the potential to decompensate based on what's going on here. So putting these features together, a rapid acute onset febrile reaction with flank pain and dark brown urine is concerning for an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. Acute hemolytic. So let's learn a little bit more about an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction before we take a look at these answer choices. Because if we don't understand what's going on here, um, we don't understand the underlying pathophysiology, we're not gonna be able to tease apart these different mechanisms because these all sound like immune mediated mechanisms that with, we could all be right if we don't understand the underlying issue. So let's move on and let's learn a little bit about acute hemolytic transfusion reactions. So the pathophysiology here is that there is acute intravascular hemolysis of transfused red blood cells. So the red blood cells that are being transfused hemolyze within the vasculature. So this is typically an intravascular hemolysis. So the mechanism is related to ABO incompatibility. So most commonly it's ABO incompatibility. And, and because the patient's blood type is going to be checked before giving a transfusion and is going to be um, cross-matched with blood in the blood bank, typically when this occurs due to ABO incompatibility, it's because of a clerical error, because it's very, would be very unlikely if we knew the patient's blood type and we knew the donor blood type for there to be an incompatibility here. So typically this could be due to a clerical error. Um, it can also be due to the presence of other antibodies. So antibodies to minor antigens such as anti-D or other minor antibodies. Um, and this is especially true in patients who have had a lot of transfusions. So this patient has beta thalassemia, so has likely received a lot of blood transfusions in his life. And so the more transfusions you have, the more of these common blood antigens you're going to be exposed to, RH, Kel, Duffy, et cetera. And so over time, patients who receive chronic transfusions do end up developing antibodies to some of these common antigens. And so that can also predispose them to having this underlying mechanism here. And so this can also predispose them to hemolytic transfusion reactions. In contrast to a non-hemolytic reaction, the time frame here is very rapid onset. It's going to be within one hour of beginning the transfusion. Some other reactions take longer, and so the time frame can help us differentiate. So how is this going to present? Classically, as the name implies, um, it's a febrile hemolytic reaction, so it's going to present with fever and chills. It's going to present with severe acute onset flank pain, and classically with hemoglobinuria. So the urine might be dark red or dark brown because of the hemoglobin that's in the urine. And this hemoglobin comes from the hemolysis that's occurring intravascularly. And this hemoglobin then goes into the urine and makes the urine very dark. Remember that hemoglobin 
as well as myoglobin can be a toxin to the renal tubules. And so if there's a lot of hemoglobin in the renal tubules, this can actually cause acute tubular necrosis and this can lead to acute renal failure. So remember that acute tubular necrosis is one of the intrinsic causes of acute kidney injury. And it can also lead to DIC and eventually to shock. So our patient still had a normal blood pressure, but over time, if this progresses rapidly, it can have very serious complications leading to renal failure, DIC, and shock. So it's very important to recognize early. They may give you a clue that blood is drawn and the serum appears to be pink. Again, this is because of the free hemoglobin that is in the serum that comes from the hemolysis of the red blood cells. And in terms of labs, it's gonna be really consistent with what we know about hemolysis. So as I mentioned, you might get an AKI, so you might get a creatinine and a BUN elevation, and this would be characteristic of an intrinsic AKI. You might see hemoglobinuria on a urinalysis, and your hemolysis labs will be positive. So remember, that's gonna be an elevated LDH, elevated bilirubin, and a low haptoglobin. You may also get a positive Coombs test because this is, as we learned, antibody-mediated hemolysis, and your plasma-free hemoglobin may be elevated, um, and that, that corresponds to the pink serum that was just mentioned. Um, so, and then just to wrap things up, because this can progress very rapidly, it's important to know that if this occurs, you should pause the transfusion, you should stop the transfusion right away because it can have these very serious complications. So if a patient does develop an acute hemolytic reaction, you want to stop the transfusion right away. So now that we understand a bit more about acute hemolytic reactions, let's take a look at our question and our answer choices again. So the features that were really important to pick up on, again, were the fact that this patient had beta thalassemia, so likely had received multiple transfusions in the past. Um, the patient, very quickly, about 20 minutes into the transfusion, developed the reaction, so the time frame fits. He develops flank pain, fever, and dark brown urine. So these features are all consistent. So now that we know that this is due to ABO incompatibility or antibodies to other minor antigens, but they didn't give us that option. So here we're gonna pick B, that's the best choice. Let's take a look at these other answer choices. So you should be able to identify which transfusion reactions are associated with which underlying mechanism. So let's look at these in a bit more detail. So answer choice A was referring to the underlying mechanism for an anaphylactic transfusion reaction. So in an anaphylactic transfusion reaction, the recipient has anti-IgA antibodies that are directed against the donor blood IgA. And this typically happens in patients with IgA deficiency who don't typically see IgA. And so they develop these anti-IgA antibodies that then are going to be targeted against the donor IgA in the donor blood. And when they recognize that IgA that they're seeing for the first time, right, because this happens in IgA deficiency, they can develop an anaphylactic reaction. Answer choice B, as we discussed, was acute hemolytic. And here, the most common mechanism is ABO incompatibility. Answer choice C was referring to a febrile non-hemolytic. So this also presents with a fever, um, but not with the other serious complications. And it can present a bit later, not typically within an hour. And this is related to cytokine release from leukocytes or leukocyte debris that are in the unit of blood. So these cytokines are released and they can cause fevers, but they don't typically cause the more morbid complications such as the hemolysis um, associated with the AKI, the DIC, and shock, right? So this is a non-hemolytic reaction. It just presents with fevers. So here the mechanism is cytokine release from leukocytes that are in the blood when it's packaged. Answer choice D was referring to an urticarial transfusion reaction. So in this transfusion reaction, the recipient has IgEs that are directed against 
some component of the blood product. And so this will present typically with hives and just simple urticaria, but is not a full anaphylactic reaction. So it doesn't get the angioedema, the wheezing, the hypotension that would be seen in anaphylaxis. It's just the hives. Answer choice E was referring to graft versus host disease. And unlike the others presented here, this actually occurs much later, within a few weeks after the transfusion, not within hours or even within minutes, such as the anaphylactic reaction. And this is due to the presence of donor T lymphocytes in the donor blood. And then finally, F was the mechanism that corresponds to a transfusion-related acute lung injury. And this typically presents with acute onset respiratory distress and can often lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome. The patient will develop pulmonary edema. And this is due to the presence of donor blood anti-leukocyte antibodies. So if you're not familiar with these other transfusion reactions, you should review them, including their characteristic features, as well as the time frame that they present with, um, the clinical findings, the labs, if any, and you should make sure to review the underlying mechanism for each of these transfusion reactions, because it could be a very similar question to this, but instead of being an acute hemolytic reaction, it might be any one of these other transfusion reactions. So you should be familiar with each of these, how they present, and what the underlying pathophysiologic mechanism is. So if you aren't familiar with them, I would go ahead and review those now. So that wraps up our question of the week, and thanks so much for listening.